We welcome you this morning to worship coming to you from the First Presbyterian Church in River Forest, Illinois. We welcome you here with very great love because this is the day that the Lord has made. And so together we rejoice and we are glad in it. This morning we are looking at the question of identity, ours and Christ's and ours in Christ. And so to set the stage for that, to help us understand where we live in this crazy, mixed-up, pandemic-laden world in the love of God, we look, first of all, to Psalm 90. And hear these words, as first we call to worship using the psalm, and then as we sing the psalm in Isaac Watts' versification. Listen for the word of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. It is so good to be back with all of you this morning. I've been gone for a few weeks taking care of my mom and a few other family things and vacation, and I'm thrilled to be worshiping with you near and far, wherever it is you are. I'm going to open us in prayer. Can we bow our heads? Oh God, we thank you for this day of life, for the gift that it is. Every day is a gift from you. We thank you, God, that you are our help in 
ages past, that we can live under the shadow of your throne, that you are sufficient alone. Thank you, God, for this opportunity to worship. Thank you for our church family. Thank you that there is no part of our life or world or problems or worries that you do not have us. So we bring to you this morning our hearts and our minds. We ask your Holy Spirit to descend upon all of us in all our homes and cars and sanctuaries, wherever it is we are. We gather to worship you, to honor you, to praise you, to trust in you, our master. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from the 16th chapter of Matthew's Gospel. This is core identity for ambassadors, apprentices of Jesus. This is an understanding that we must have. And Peter was the first. Listen for the word of the Lord. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, You are blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means the rock. And upon this rock... I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. This is the word of the Lord. So today we really are talking about identity. We're coming to the end of this elongated series that we have done in honor of the pandemic, the race we never signed up for. And I've been told by people who do marathons and triathlons that toward the end of the race, you can almost begin to forget who you are. You just fixate on the finish line and you want to get there. So I thought it would be good if we talked a little bit about identity how we see ourselves, how other people see the life that we are living, but most importantly, who we say our Savior really is. I saw a funny story about a guy who was driving through the streets of a town not unlike River Forest or Wheaton or any of the suburbs and came past one of those really annoying traffic cameras. And he was going the speed limit. He was absolutely sure he was going the speed limit, but as he went by, the camera took his picture. And he thought, that's strange. And so just for fun, he circled around the block, and he went past the same camera slower, and it took his picture. And he thought, now this is really weird. So he kept doing it. He kept going around the block, and every time he went past the camera, it took his picture. Five times. And the fifth time, he was crawling. And so he's kind of laughing to himself and saying, this is the strangest thing I've ever seen. I can hardly wait to see if I get ticketed because I can prove how fast I was really going. Five times he went past. And later on, not too long after, he got five tickets for failing to wear a seatbelt. 
It's a question of how we see ourselves, how we see our life. And this is exactly what the disciples and Jesus were working at. Because what we're talking about in this particular reading is nothing more and nothing less than the core identity of the church. For ministers, for elders, for deacons, for congregation members, for anybody who claims to follow the risen Savior. This is the core question. Who do you say Jesus is? And when we get it right, the church is strong. When we get it right, our lives are full and focused. When we get it right, we are experiencing the kingdom of God. And when we waffle on this, the church is weak. We are weak. We fail to be the people God calls us to be. It's no accident that this conversation took place in Caesarea Philippi. It was up on the edge of Israel. It was up on the region where Baal and lots of other gods were worshipped. It was up in the area where there was a lot of confusion about who God might really be. And so Jesus starts off by saying to his disciples, let's focus on our God, shall we? Let's forget what's going on around us, the claims that people are making around us. Let's focus on Yahweh. Let's focus on this particular God. And he asks them, who does the world say that God is? A very legitimate question for us in 2020. And a question that we will be looking at through the course of the fall, especially as we get into the later fall. We're going to be asking, if God is who God claims to be, then what the heck? Why this year? Why? is every news cycle unfolding something more? What is it about all this? Who do people say the Son of Man is? Jesus asked his disciples. And then, as now, they're always coming up with some kind of spectacular understanding of God. Oh, they said, well, some say John the Baptist, who must have been resurrected because he was dead. He'd been beheaded. Wow, mighty power there. Or some say that the Son of Man is Elijah, who was and by Jewish folklore will be, and so maybe reincarnated some way or other. Or Jeremiah, the honored, honored prophet. But then Jesus gets really personal. And he says, who do you say that I am? Not who do you say the Son of Man is. Not who does the world say I am. But who do you say I am? This is the frame. Think back, if you get our Thursday e-news, think back to the illustration I was using there, the jigsaw puzzle frame. This is the frame we have to get right. This is the answer that when we get it right, all the other pieces can start to fit together in this complex life God has given us. And if we get it wrong, we're going to be forever saying, well, I don't know, that blue kind of matches this blue, but there's a little yellow in it. Who do you say I am, Jesus said. It's a decisive issue. 
and it shapes the content of life. And look very closely at Peter's response. Peter didn't say, well, rumor has it that. Peter didn't even say, you know, I'm, I think that you are. Peter didn't even say, well, Jesus, for us. Peter said, you are Christ. You are the one. It was a decisive statement. It was a powerful statement. Some commentators wonder if Peter knew exactly what he was saying or if it was the Holy Spirit speaking through him. Peter only knows. But the statement was made. You are the Christ. You are the living one. And not just for me, not just for us, your peeps, not just for people who might want to believe in you, you are Christ. You are the King. You are the living one. And we must be as decisive in our proclamation of Jesus. Otherwise, the church comes off like the politician who says, well, these are my convictions. If you don't like them, I have others. He is the Christ, which means God's King. He is the Christ, which means God's anointed one, God's be-all and end-all, God's once and for all, drop the mic, King. That's who Jesus is. Now that's a that's an answer we can understand if we think in sort of Christendom language. A lot of people my age and older grew up in a world where that language makes sense, those words make sense. But in the world around us right now, I don't know. Dale Bruner one of my favorite Matthean commentators spent a great deal of time in the Philippines. And in Manila, right in the center of town, is a church whose name is on top of the building so you can see it from a long ways away. And it's Christ the Answer Church. And Dale suggests that Peter's confession in modern English could be, you are the answer, you are the point, you are the last word. Meaning, Jesus, you're it. There is no other. We're following you. We're living for you. We're proclaiming you. We're telling people about you. We're shaping our lives around you. You are it. There is no other. There is no option. You are God's plan. And more than that, you are God. Right about now you're saying, okay, all right, fine. And? And that's a fair question. Because we can say all the right things, but how do we live into them? We can claim all the right things, but how do we grasp them and help them to change who we are from the inside out? In order to do that, we have to see not only what we say about Christ, but what Jesus says about us. Because over the years in pastoral ministry, I've met a lot of people who are convinced that Jesus is the Christ. But when it comes to them, 
the identity question is so foggy. And so I want to go to a place that makes it abundantly clear. Who does Jesus say you are? You are. You are. You are. I am. You are. In the letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, a text you've heard a lot from this pulpit in the last four years. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and I would say in there, and distracts. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Who? Jesus. The pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Do you see yourself in that text? Look closer. Jesus came to this world for you. You're his joy. You are the joy of God. You, not the person next to you, just you. This is no time to squirrel. This is no time to deflect. This is no time to say, oh, I couldn't. You, you are the joy of God. You are his passion. You are his crown. You are his beloved. You are the one that he looks upon through the lens of his son, Jesus, and smiles the smile that only God can. Jesus. Jesus is the one who ran the race for all of us. Jesus is the one who endured the pain of the cross for you and for me. Jesus is the one who put, took, took the sin of the world on himself for you and for me. Jesus is the one. Because you and I are his joy. Jesus, Jesus is the one who is the love that you have been looking for in every other love you've ever experienced. Jesus is the one who is the yes you have been looking for in every other yes you've ever heard. Jesus is the one who stands against the no of this world right up to and including death and hell itself. Jesus is the one who intercedes for us at the throne of God. Jesus is the one who did all he did, who lived the way he lived, who reigns the way he reigns, who prays the way he prays, who will return one day for you and for me. Do you know that? Do you? Because if you do, to the extent that you do, to the extent that you know that love in your heart, to the extent that you know that when he looks at you, he sees his joy, he sees his crown, he sees all that he ever wanted in this world. To the extent that you know that, you and I will live differently. Even in a racially divided, pandemically afflicted, confused, conflicted, politically strangle-held world, we will live differently because we are not dependent on this world. We're dependent on the Savior. We are not of this world. We are people of God. We are not stranded here. We are resident aliens in this place living here to show the kingdom of God in a broken and hurting world until Jesus returns or we return to him. And so in this place, in this day, in this hour, in this week, wherever you are, whoever you are, hear this. It's his love for you that defines you. He's your savior. He's your lover. He's your king. The 
king of all the ages, the king of all eternity, is closer to you and closer to me than the closest human relationship we will ever know. And this is why when we baptize, this is why we say to an adult or even to a child, for you, beloved, Jesus came into the world. For you, he lived and he showed God's love. For you, he suffered the darkness of Calvary. For you, he uttered the cry, it is finished. For you, he rose triumphant over death and ascended to be with God. And there he prays for you. Even though you may not yet know it. But in this, the word of Scripture becomes true. We love him. We love Jesus. We proclaim Jesus. We worship Jesus. We live for Jesus because he first loved us. Oh, and sisters and brothers, that is very good news. Thank you, choir, for that beautiful song. It's time now for us to go to the Lord in prayer. 
And it's a wonderful thing that he invites us to do that because we have a lot to pray about. Will you bow your heads, please? Oh God, we praise you this day. We give you all praise, glory, and honor. You are the King of kings, the Lord of lords. Oh God, we particularly give you praise this morning for the marriage yesterday of Lizzie Kovic and her new husband, Patrick. We ask your blessing on their life and their future together. We give you particular praise and, and, and um, thanksgiving for the birth last week on the 14th of Luciana Nardi, little baby girl. And we ask your blessings on her and her older sister and her parents, Chad and Tiffany. We thank you again for your blessings in the life of Lisa Alfonsi and her husband and child and continue to ask healing for her in her body. And we thank you, God, for the life of Mitchell Hill and for the opportunity we had this week to praise you for his life and the great work you did in his heart. We praise you, O oh God, that indeed we are your beloved, that you are the anointed one, that no matter how crazy our world gets, that you are the king. I ask, O oh God, that you would help us to anoint you as the one of our every minute and our every hour and our every day. O oh God, help us to think about who we not only say that you are, but who we make you to be in our lives. Help us to remember that how we see you determines how we see ourselves. And I pray, O oh God, that we would see ourselves individually and as a church as your beloved. Not only, God, I pray that we would have your lens, that we would see ourselves through the cross, through your smile, through your joy and your delight in us, but I pray, O oh God, that you would also enable us to see our neighbors and our enemies as your beloved, that you would help us to love them. We lift up to you this morning a number of people who need your help. We pray for George Van Verst and Martha Tronto and Jim Keel for healing in their bodies, for encouragement and peace. We continue to pray for um, comfort in sorrow and in grief for Larice and her family, as well as a number of other people this summer and this spring who have lost dear loved ones. We pray especially for Steve Kovic, that you would comfort him also. We pray for Vincent Hill, that you would bring quick healing and quick ease of pain after his accident and his burns. We thank you for being with each one of our senior citizens, those who are shut in, those who are still unable to have visitors. We especially think of Nancy Ahrens and Olive Mobed, Sandy Stevens, and we lift up to you Dorothy Peoples. We know, O oh God, that you can be the companion to each one of us. We pray for Dan and Carol Brown this day. O oh God, we ask that you would comfort them in the loss of Dan's mother this weekend. O oh God, we pray that your um, very presence would be with that family and that you would bring fond memories for them. We pray for the new babies, those that have already been born this summer and those who are yet to be born. We particularly pray for Michelle and Jeremy Fine and their child, as well as Emily and Tim McAdam and their unborn baby. We pray for Michelle's mom, Teresa, that you would continue to bring healing in her life. We pray for Nigel Lee in prison. Oh God, that you would bring your special touch and encourage him. We pray for the Fillion family, and we thank you, God, for your love in their lives. We pray for all four of them, for your special touch and your special encouragement. We pray for all of our teenagers, all of our college kids, really all of our students of all ages of school, that you would help them as they have begun school last week or this coming week. And there's so much uncertainty, and it's so hard to do things remotely and online, and it's just a season of chaos. But we thank you, O oh God, that there's no such thing as chaos with you. That in you, as Colossians tells us, all things hold together. That in you we have calm and we have peace, 
And as Paul preached, that if we keep our eyes fixed on you, we may not know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future, and it's okay. Thank you, Jesus, for that. We continue to pray for our leaders, elected and otherwise, nationally, and in our state leaders and our city and, and neighborhoods. We pray for these elections coming up. We pray, O oh God, that we would be your people and that we would represent you, Lord Jesus, that we would be uh, ministers and witnesses of you, our King, in everything we do. So we thank you that you've heard all our hearts and prayers. We give to you now the quiet concerns of our hearts. Just for a few seconds, Lord, hear our prayers. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you see us, that you see what we pray about and what we don't pray about, and that you love us. We pray together now to honor you, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Praise God that he does hear our prayers, all of them. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Praise God that this is an approachable God. Praise God that who Jesus is, is loving and kind and good. And when we know that who, who Jesus is, that we can make him the king of our lives. So we can also make him the king of our belongings and our possessions and our relationships and our resources. And so at this time, we have a chance once again to give back to God with our offerings and with our tithes. And as you know, there are many ways to do that. If you look on your screen, you will see you can donate online at firstpresrf.org or by texting to First Pres RF, or by uh, your purchases through Amazon Smile. And you, of course, always welcome to mail in a check or, or um, drop one off or whatever it is, but we appreciate your cheerful hearts, we appreciate your giving hearts and your generosity, and we appreciate the fact that you know we're all in this together. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God, and we have so much to be thankful for. We have so much to give back to the Lord. So let's do that now.
this morning, we actually have announcements, which means that we are headed back in toward the fall. And ministry is starting, even this kind of wacky time. And so the first announcement is that on Tuesday evening, September the 1st at 7 p.m., we have our annual meeting. And this is for members of the congregation who can vote. Uh, We will have up to 50 people here in the sanctuary, COVID restrictions in place, masks distanced. And you can make reservations on the website if you would like to be in the sanctuary live for that meeting. But we will also have a Zoom link for those to participate who... Um, either don't want to be in the sanctuary or don't get reservations in fast enough. And uh, at that annual meeting, one of the things that we are going to be doing, which is a little odd for us, is uh, this is actually now a combination of the congregational meeting where we nominate and elect elders and deacons and then the annual meeting of the church. We're truncating those because of the goofy schedule that we've had this year. So our nominees for the office of elder class of 2023 are Roberta Gates, Ruth Johnson, Natalie Knox, Bill Couser, and Heather Rudzinski. And same class, our nominees for the office of deacon are Amanda Ebersol for her second term, Lena Fagador, Joe Hammond for his second term, Cindy Reynolds, Dan Lundak for a second term, And we are still seeking two additional deacons. So if God is speaking to you in any way about the possibility of you serving as a deacon, as we often say, this is the heart of First Press, we would be interested in hearing from you, but also we will be possibly tapping you on the shoulder. On Thursday nights, beginning this last Thursday night at 7 p.m., we are having a Zoom-based prayer And uh, if you'd like to have more information about that, uh, you'll see the link in the Thursday e-news always, but you can also talk to Nancy Nicholas and her phone number is on your screen. The um, first Sunday in September, Labor Day weekend actually, we will be celebrating Holy Communion. And this is, we want to give you a heads up to be sure that you have bread and wine or grape juice so that you can participate in that where you are as we also share in that here. And uh, then also, as we go further into the fall, Lisa Sung is going to be coming back to First Press. She has a uh, his deep history with us, and she is going to be teaching a, an adult education class on race, ethnicity, and uh, theological perspective. And this will be starting on Sunday, the 13th of September. Uh, we'll get more information out to you on exactly how this happens. We're going to be starting this on Zoom We're hoping that maybe as this goes along, we can be doing more in person, but we have to see what happens uh, in the world around us, of course. And then, finally, introducing our two new interim co-directors of youth ministry, Grace Neweich and Jack Bell. And we welcome them into this ministry. Um, If you have uh, kids in middle school and high school, you'll be hearing from them. Uh, because they're going to be getting those groups back together again and active, and um, we uh, ask for your prayers for them as they step in at this particular point in time. And we thank Grace and Jack so much for hearing God's call to them uh, for ministry now. Sisters and brothers, who do you say Jesus is? He's the Christ. The Son of the living God. He is your Savior, and He is my Savior. And so, as we go into this next series of days, we don't go alone. Jesus promised He would never leave us as orphans. He is with us day after day after day until He comes again. In that knowledge, And in the knowledge of his love for you, live this day, live this week, live this goofy, prolonged, wacky year as an apprentice of Jesus. You are dearly, dearly loved. So go into this world in the name of God, who is Father and Son and Holy Spirit, and go in peace.